All righty, I want to welcome everybody at our 288 campus, our Friendswood campus, our Alvin campus, our Webster campus, our Pearland campus, everybody in our online campus right now, and everybody up north at the Weibo Bible Church in Weibo, Montana. How you doing all? Everybody good? Everybody good today? Okay, fantastic. Glad that you're in church today, and uh, I am uh, thrilled uh, that I have an announcement. I, uh, if you were with us last week, we celebrated our 35th anniversary as a church, and God has been so good to us as a church family. He's been so good. Been awesome. But I have some news today that, uh, that uh, I think that you are going to appreciate and, and be, be very happy about, be thrilled to hear this. And so I, I'm going to read it just to make sure that I get it exactly right, but it pertains to everybody in our church family and also everybody that's just joining with us today, maybe for the first time. Here it is. Jesus is alive. That's that's the news. <laughs> and it is true, and it makes this, uh, this weekend a very special weekend. But it's not just a special weekend because of what happened 2,000 years ago, but because of what can happen today because of what happened 2,000 years ago. And I say that because Jesus is still the same. The same yesterday, today, and forever. He's still, he's still changing people for the better. He's still empowering people. He's still rescuing people. He's still setting people free from sin and addictions, restoring marriages and relationships. He's still forgiving. He's still saving. And uh, today what I want to do is I want to show you how, okay, something 2,000 years ago, how is that still working today? what he wants to do in people's lives. And the way that I want to show you this today is through some Easter pictures. That's actually the name of the sermon today is Easter pictures. Now, I want to start with pictures that people often associate with Easter. Okay, so if you are on social media and you took a picture and then you hashtagged it, these are just some pictures that people might hashtag as Easter. Here's the first one. Um, can I just go on record today and say that I am not a fan of the Easter Bunny? The Easter Bunny's always creeped me out. Anybody else? I don't. I'm not. I'm not up for like a six foot dude in a suit uh, anywhere near my kids. But anyway, um, so not really a fan. Here's another uh, picture that might be hashtagged as Easter. It would be an Easter basket full of eggs. We uh, did this growing up. My mom would always make us Easter baskets and, and put little treats in there, but also a couple of fun things. And my wife did the same thing as our kids were growing up. She, she would make the, <laughs> she overdid it. She made uh, big old Easter baskets and there would be toys and stuff inside there along with uh, uh, candy and so forth. And, and she was lamenting the other night. She said, uh, I used to, you know, do this all the time for our kids and our kids are grown now and I miss it so much. And so I just want to tell you, if you didn't get an Easter basket this year, uh, my wife will make one for you. So <laughs> she's at the, uh, at the Pearland campus right now, so she'll appreciate that. Um, another one that might be hashtagged Easter would be Easter eggs. And this seems to be a tradition with some family to color the Easter eggs. Anybody still doing this? Anybody still doing this? Okay. Maybe not somebody this year with the price of eggs, right? But uh, just went... <laughs> You just went plastic instead. And then there is the only Easter bunny that I want in my house, and that would be the smaller uh, chocolate one. I've got one more picture for you in, the, in this intro. And just for the record, this is the favorite, my favorite one of all of these. Uh, and it, it happens to be those Reese's peanut butter and chocolate Easter egg shaped. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Oh, they're just so good. I don't know if they're good for you. Actually, actually, I read that they contain like 1.5 uh, grams of protein. So they are good for you. <laughs> so that's all good. But anyway, give me a stack of those, a glass of milk, and get out because I'm, I'm okay. Uh, but even though these things might be, you know, tasty or fun or even kind of creepy, those pictures, though they may get the hashtag of Easter, those pictures will not change a person's life. And I feel like the danger that surrounds, you know, these kinds of holidays is that this is all some people know. And so they miss the actual reason why we can even celebrate anything today. Now, I want to take you to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where the Apostle Paul gives us three pictures for this weekend. He gives us a picture for Friday, a picture for Saturday, and a picture for Sunday. This is 
Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. <clears throat> he says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ did what? Died. He died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was what? Buried. He was buried and that he was what? Raised on the third day in accordance with the scripture. And that line right there, in accordance with the scripture, means according to the Old Testament prophecies. And this, my friends, is the gospel. That's the gospel. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And what he did for us on this weekend so long ago makes this the perfect weekend for anyone who's outside of Christ to join the family of God. And I say that even if you have never been in church before, even if you've spent your entire life in another religion and your roots are there and, and you have known nothing different your entire life. By the way, we had a young lady on Thursday night at our service that um, she gave her heart to Jesus and was baptized and she had never been in church before until this church. She gave her heart to Jesus and got baptized on Thursday night. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> So even if you're here for the first time today, even if you're here for the first time, this is a perfect opportunity for you. And I know when people come to a church, there's a lot of fear and trepidation if they've never been to a church or if they've never been to that church before. And so, so far, uh, hopefully you're okay, you know, if you're brand new with us and we're not scaring you too much and, and uh, we haven't passed out snakes yet. Um, that's at the end of the service, so stay tuned. I'm kidding, it's not that gonna happen. Um, but Whoever you are, even if you're here for the first time, Jesus gives you the invitation to become part of his family, the family of God. Amen. Let me explain how that's even possible by looking a little closer at these three pictures. Now, the first one that Paul gives to us would be the picture from Friday, which is Jesus on the cross, a picture of grace, a picture of grace. Someone once described grace as God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. And that, my friends, is exactly what happened on the cross. Now, you might already be aware of this, but Jesus didn't deserve to die on the cross. Not only had he done nothing worth execution, he had done nothing wrong at all, ever. He was on trial, kind of a mock trial, before the Roman governor Pilate was his name. And uh, Pilate told the crowd that was gathered there, I find no fault in him. I find no fault in him. In fact, Pilate's wife had had a dream and it troubled her greatly because in the dream she saw that Jesus was innocent. And so she came to Pilate, her husband said, you gotta let this guy go. You have to let him go. He's innocent. And so, and if you guys, if you guys are married, you know when your wife does that, you gotta figure out a way. And so he actually tried to figure out a way and the way that he thought would work was this, that every year during the Passover, which is when this happened, every year during the Passover, he would release someone from prison just to appease the Jewish religious leaders. So anybody they had in custody was fair game. They, would, they could release at least one person. So to increase the odds of Jesus's release, Pilate had the absolute worst prisoner that they had on hand brought before him, a guy named Barabbas. And the Bible says this in Matthew 27 about him. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. And just so you know, notorious means famous for being evil. And Barabbas was evil, evil a, a violent man, a murderer, a thief, among other things. He was locked away, presumably awaiting his own execution. Next verse. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to the crowd, whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who's called Christ, which means Messiah? So this is multiple choice. You understand what he's doing? If you're a parent, you understand this. Um, uh, uh, and one illustration, you come home, you want to watch the game, the kids are on the, using the uh, uh, big TV. And so you, you come in and they've wa they're watching a show they've watched 547 times before. And so you give them multiple choice. You say, hey, guys, you can go ahead and watch this show that you've seen so many times. And then afterwards, I want you to clean the entire house. <laughs> or you can watch the game with me and eat as much ice cream as you want. Okay? <laughs> so that's trying. You're, what you're doing is trying to weight the multiple choice so that they choose what you want them to choose. And I think with Pilate's multiple choice strategy, that's what he was hoping. 
that there was no way that they would choose someone who was evil over someone who had done absolutely nothing wrong. But that's exactly what happened. He said, he said who, who do you want me to release to you? And the crowd began to chant, Barabbas, Barabbas, Barabbas. Once he quieted them down, he said, then what am I supposed to do with Jesus? And that's when they began to, to shout out, crucify him, crucify him. And so Barabbas was set free and Jesus was crucified. And that, my friends, is my story. That's my story. I had broken God's commands. I deserved God's wrath. But Jesus took my place, my punishment on the cross, and I was set free. How many of you are thankful for the cross of Jesus Christ today in church? Now, I'll tell you what, one of the things I've heard throughout the years, because I've been doing this for a while now, one of the things that I've heard from people is, well, I'm not that bad. Like, I'm not notorious, okay? I'm not that bad of a sinner. And uh, in fact, one time, uh, years and years ago, talking to a guy about coming to church, and he told me that he knew somebody in our church, and he knew them, and he said, I'm a better person than them. And what he was doing was saying, I don't really need to come to church because I'm already better than somebody that goes to your church. So he was doing kind of like a... As if God graded on a curve, you know, like God graded on a curve. He's okay because he's better than somebody else. But let's fact check that kind of thinking by asking this question. How good are you? How good are you? So on a scale of zero uh, to 100, with zero being the absolute worst sinner in the world, and 100 being someone who has never, ever, ever sinned, based on your record of sin, the number of sins that you've committed, the, the severity of the sins that you've committed, where would you place yourself? Before you answer, let me help you. There's only been one person in the history of the world to score 100. His name is Jesus and you're not him. So and don't take that personally. Don't take that personally, okay? But, so no one is sinless. So no one gets 100. Jesus is sinless. So let's go ahead and put a cross over the 100 signifying Jesus right there. The rest of us have sin, correct? Okay, all right, well, maybe you haven't. I don't know. Let me, let me check, let me check. Uh, is there anyone among us today at church, all of our campuses, anyone who's ever told a lie, like a half-truth or you exaggerated to make yourself look better? Anybody want to admit today that they have lied? Raise your hand up, okay. I see some people, some people didn't raise their hands. Um, <laughs> And, and, and uh, not to be the bearer of bad news, but uh, you just lied. So all of us have, <laughs> all of us have lied. Let's, uh, let's try another question. I'm not going to go all the way through the Ten Commandments, but let's just do another one for the fun of it. Has anyone at church today ever taken something that did not belong to you, whether you were young or just recently you've taken something that did not belong to you? Okay, okay, not everybody. Let me press into that. Have you ever been at work and it was Amazon Prime Day? Or something else was going on. And so you kind of goofed off. You kind of goofed off. You weren't working the job that you were being paid to work. And then your paycheck came and you kept all of it. <laughs> you didn't give back for those hours that you were goofing off. Well, that means that you took something that didn't belong to you. Anybody want to revote now? And, uh... <laughs> so what I'm seeing at church today so far is that we have a, a whole lot of lion thieves in church today. I don't <laughs> Welcome to New Hope Church. Glad you're here. <laughs> Just for the fun of it, let me ask this question. Have you ever had an argument on the way to church? Like you said some things that, okay. Okay, for some reason, it's a spiritual battle coming to church. <laughs> and it's a battle with the kids and maybe with the spouse. And I have literally seen people get out of their vehicle, walk toward the building, and they're like... But then a miracle from God happens as they get closer to the building. <laughs> Their face is less etched with anger, and it begins to soften. The, the gestures are, are leaving their body now, and they're all good, and they get closer to the greeters, and then they have a big smile on their face, and they're like, hallelujah. <laughs> I'm just, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Thank you, brother. Thank you, sister. 
Okay, so I'm just saying we've all messed up. We've all messed up. We've all had thoughts about other people that were not good. We've treated others badly or worse. None of us would score a 100. But honestly, we probably don't have any zeros in church either today. And I say that because this is reserved for the worst of the worst. Guys like, you know, Hitler and Joseph Stalin and Jeffrey Epstein. And so we're not zero, but we're not 100 either. We're not 100 either. In fact, I don't think that even like a couple of the best people that I have heard about, read about, uh, Mother Teresa and Billy Graham, I don't think that either one of those people would score themselves above 50. If they did, which I have never heard that they scored themselves, but I'm thinking they would be, they would put themselves somewhere south of 50. And I say that because I've read about them, their humility, and also because I know that the closer a person gets to God, the more they realize how much of a sinner they are and that they need God. And so they would be, they would be probably somewhere south of 50. And, and if that's true, I'm just thinking out loud here, don't take offense to this. I'm thinking none of us in church today would rank above Billy and Mother Teresa. So you think about this, we would be above Hitler, <laughs> but below Billy, I love you. Have I told you that lately? I love you guys. Uh, which leaves us far, far away from sinlessness, from 100, from perfection which is a problem because in order to get into heaven someday, you can't have any sin on your record. Matthew 5, uh, verse 48, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount said, be ye therefore perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect. That's the, that's the standard that it takes to get into heaven, into God's presence. And I know that there are people who say, well, I may not be perfect, but I'm pretty good, however, James chapter 2, verse 10, whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it, which technically moves us down a few more notches on the scale. And someday, we're all going to stand before God, a perfect, holy, all-powerful God who does not, cannot, will not tolerate sin in his presence, meaning if we have sin on our record, it's not going to be a good day for us. It's not going to cut it. So the question quickly goes from how good am I to how can I be made right with God? I have the answer. The cross of Jesus, it's a picture of grace. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 says, Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. So Jesus took our punishment for our sin on the cross. And then the moment before he died, he said this, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now, it's an interesting choice of word here. And I say word because in the Greek, this is one word. Uh, this is the word tetelestai or tetelestai, which is an accounting term, actually. So if you were in the marketplace or at a bank, you might hear them use this word, but this is kind of an odd word to use when you're about to die on the cross. The way, another way that it can be translated and what it meant in the marketplace was this. The debt has been paid. The debt has been paid. So what debt was he talking about? He was talking about my sin debt and your sin debt. When a person places their faith in Jesus, suddenly all of us who scored low on the how good are you quiz, we suddenly get a score of 100, a score of perfection. Why? Not because we're perfect, but because Jesus is perfect and he takes our score, our sin on himself, and he gives to us his score of 100, which means what Jesus did for us on the cross really is a picture of grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. He took the punishment so that we wouldn't have to, and now we get the rewards that we don't deserve. How many of you are grateful for the cross of Jesus today? Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> So that's picture number one, and this is our Friday picture. Now I want to move to Saturday, 
because that's the day that Jesus' body was still in the tomb on that Saturday. And uh, Jesus in the tomb for us is a picture of complete sacrifice. It's a picture of complete sacrifice. There are people to this day who say that uh, Jesus only lost consciousness on the cross. And then once they put him in the tomb, the coolness of the tomb, the humidity or whatever, made him recover. And then he got up and pushed away the gargantuan stone that they say weighed between one and a half and two and a half tons. He just kind of pushed that out of the way after being crucified, meaning he faked his resurrection by faking his death. That's actually called the swoon theory, the swoon theory. But if you look at the facts of the crucifixion and what he suffered, then you know there's absolutely no way that that could happen. That theory is 100% impossible. Jesus was not only crucified, he was tortured before his crucifixion, so much so that the prophet Isaiah says, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. Meaning he was so beat up, so bloody, so messed up that you had to do a double take to see that he was even a human being. Listen to me. The Romans were experts at killing people. They were experts at executing people. And even though Jesus was pronounced dead on the cross, a soldier still took a spear and jammed it up into his side, into his chest cavity, and then yanked that spear back out. And the apostle John tells us in his record, he was an eyewitness of these events on that day. He says, out came blood and water separated. Now, you can Google this when you get home. No Googling in church, but you can Google it when you get home. Um, uh, there are two medical theories out there as to why blood and water would come out of his side separated, but both of those mean that he was dead. That's the only way that can happen. So Jesus died on the cross. He died on the cross. His dead body was taken down off of the cross and laid in a tomb. And I want you to remember something. One word from Jesus, and he could have stopped the process. He could have. In the Garden of Gethsemane, when he was arrested and Peter tried to stop the guys who were arresting him and took a sword and tried to, tried to defend Jesus, Jesus like, come on, man. Don't you know that with one word I could call on my father and he would send 10,000 angels to come and rescue me? But he allowed himself to be arrested, to be tortured, and to be crucified. He did not hold back. He gave his all for you. And the tomb on Saturday is a picture of that total sacrifice. September 29th, 2006, Petty Officer Michael A. Mansour, a United States Navy SEAL, was operating in Ramadi, Iraq. Mansour was standing on a rooftop in Ramadi in front of a doorway that led to that roof. There were two Navy SEAL teammates lying in the sniper-prone position on either side of him. They had already taken AK-47 fire and a rocket-propelled grenade, but they were not exactly sure where the enemy was. There was a bit of a lull in the fighting, but then someone got on the loudspeaker at the local mosque and began yelling for everyone to go kill the Americans. As Mansour and his team were anticipating that next attack, an insurgent from an unknown location threw a grenade up onto the rooftop, it hit Mansour in the chest and fell to his feet. Due to the length of the throw, there wasn't time for him to pick it up and throw it back off of the roof. Mansour only had a split second to make a decision. He could leap through the doorway behind him and save himself, but if he did, his teammates would surely die. Mansoor yelled, grenade! And instead of jumping backward to save himself, he jumped forward, chest first onto that grenade. It detonated. And 30 minutes later, 25-year-old Michael Mansoor was pronounced dead. His two teammates received only minor injuries because Mansoor's body had muffled the blast. One of those survivors said at uh, Mansoor's funeral, Mikey looked death in the face that day. And he said, you will not take my friends. I will go in their stead. Michael Mansour was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor, which was accepted by his parents on his behalf. 
And since then, his, uh, his high school in Garden Grove, California, has built a new stadium, and they named it the Michael A. Monsoor Memorial Stadium, the uh, golden trident insignia that the Navy SEALs wear proudly emblazoned on the 50-yard line in Michael's honor. Then in 2019, the United States Navy commissioned the newest guided missile destroyer in the fleet Zoom Walt class, the USS Michael A. Monsoor. All fitting awards for a very brave young man. But why? Why the accolades? Why the tributes? I'm going to tell you why. It's straight out of the Bible. Because there is no greater love than when someone lays down their life to save a friend. And if you've been wondering lately in your life, maybe things haven't been going well, maybe some people have walked away from you, and if you've been wondering, does anybody really love me? Does anybody care about what I'm going through? Is anybody there for me? I just want you to think for a moment about the tomb on Saturday with Jesus' lifeless body still inside. And remember, he loved you so much that he held nothing back. It was total sacrifice for you. He gave his all. Every drop of blood was for you so that you could be in the family of God, so that your sins could be forgiven, so that your debt could be paid, so that you could have salvation, so that you could live in heaven someday. The picture of the cross shows us that Jesus took our place so that we could have God's grace. The picture of the tomb shows us that he gave his all completely. And then picture number three, which is for a Sunday, um, and here's what it means. The resurrection of Jesus is a picture of victory, a picture of victory. The Bible says that the power of sin is death. The power of sin is death. Therefore, in order to beat sin, Jesus had to beat sin's power, sin's enforcer, sin's bouncer, so to speak. So Jesus did battle with a foe that no one else could beat, death itself. And the stakes were oh so high. And, and this is why this is so important today on this day, in our age, in our time right now. If Jesus did not beat death, if he did not resurrect, then the cross was powerless and Jesus' death was in vain. Which means that our sins would still be unforgiven. We would still be hell bound without hope. But something miraculous happened in that tomb on that Sunday morning. Jesus' heart, lifeless and still since that torturous Friday, now on this Sunday morning, beat once and then again and again. And as his heart found its rhythm, I'm sure that with every beat, the demons of hell began to tremble. Is this really happening? In a tomb where nothing had moved since Friday when they rolled the stone in place, there was the flinch of the fingers on a nail-scarred hand. And then the sudden intake of air. As his body, once dead, was now in need of oxygen, as blood was once again traveling through his veins, his skin regaining its color, his eyes closed in death on Friday on this Sunday morning, fluttered once and then twice and then slowly reopened. As Max Lucado wrote, in that moment, the cemetery of death became a maternity ward of life that gave birth to the question that hell hates to answer. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Jesus is alive. He has won the victory. <laughs> and that's our Sunday picture, our third picture. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this right here. And I just want you to know something. The resurrection sealed the deal. Without the resurrection, there would be no forgiveness of sins. Without the resurrection, there would be no celebration today. But today we can celebrate because thank you, Lord, he is alive. Now I want to read to you from John's gospel account of the resurrection. And this is the one that my heart just sort of leans toward because it's kind of raw and real. You can tell it's real. Not that the other ones aren't real, but I'm just saying the way that John wrote it firsthand. Uh, John chapter 20, I'm going to read eight verses. He writes, now on the first day of the week, which is what day? 
It's not a trick question. What day is that? Sunday. So this is our Sunday picture, okay? We had a Friday picture, Saturday picture, now Sunday picture. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple. And this is how John describes himself. The one whom Jesus loved. Okay, we get it, all right? And, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, that was with John, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter. Thank you, John, for that. Outran Peter and reached the tomb first. I think they had a beef going on or something. But Verse 5, and stooping to look in, John saw the what? He saw the linen cloths lying there. Read it with me. He saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Verse 6, then Simon Peter came. He didn't, he didn't stand around outside the tomb. Boom, he goes right in, and he saw what? Read it with me. The linen cloths lying there. Verse 7, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, not lying with what? The linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Verse 8, then the other disciple, uh, uh, John, who had reached the tomb first, okay, John, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he what? He Okay, so it's interesting to me that uh, John gives so much attention to the grave clothes. That's what the linen cloths were. Those were grave clothes. Now, obviously, Jesus wasn't in the tomb, and that was implied in the text. But what gets mentioned three times in this short passage is the presence of grave clothes. And John saw that. He didn't see Jesus because Jesus was not in there. But he saw the grave clothes and, and, and took a look at the tomb, and what he saw made him believe. Now, I, I believe in part it was because of those grave clothes that he believed. And let me give you the short version as to why I think that that impacted John in the way that it did. John knew that men who are alive don't wear grave clothes. Men who are alive don't wear grave clothes. And I believe that that may be a word for someone today. I say that because maybe we have someone with us who is on a spiritual detour in your life. You are spiritually stuck. You're still in your sins. Listen to me, if that's you, there have been a whole lot of people praying for you and praying for this moment in the service right here. So, Lord, don't let me mess it up. Hear me now. Because of Jesus' resurrection and his victory, you can have the victory. And that's why I said at the beginning of this sermon, that this is a special weekend, not just because of what happened 2,000 years ago, but because of what can happen in us today because of what happened 2,000 years ago. You can be the recipient of Jesus' victory. And if you have been on that long detour away from God and you know that things are not right, you know that you're not close to God, I just want you to know something right now. You don't have to run from God. You don't have to run from God. You don't have to hide you don't have to go through life with guilt and shame, unforgiven and unsure of your salvation, maybe thinking that you can never be good enough for God. Well, listen to me. None of us are good enough for God on our own, but thank you, Jesus, because he took his perfection and made a way for us through his death, his burial, and his resurrection. He won the victory, and he wants to give it to you. So what do you do? You receive it. How do you receive it? Through faith. The Bible actually says repent, which means to turn away from your sins and turn to Jesus, to put your faith in him. So you're, you're not following after sin anymore. You're following after Jesus. You put your faith in him. And, and then something that follows closely on the heels of that, and we see it on the day of Pentecost on what really is the first Easter sermon. Peter's preaching to the crowd, and they said, what do we do? What do we do? because they were cut to the heart about what happened to Jesus. And he said, repent, so turn away from your sins, turn to Jesus, and then be baptized. Now, why did baptism all of a sudden enter the, the discussion at that point? 
Because here's why. Baptism has all three pictures in it. The death of Jesus, the burial of Jesus, and the resurrection of Jesus. And what that shows the world, it's a public declaration of faith. What it shows the world is that you're following after the one who died, was buried, and resurrected for you. And if you've never accepted Christ, if you never put your faith in him, or if you have and you haven't yet been baptized, uh, our campus pastors will tell you more about that in just a moment, but I'll let them do that. But uh, just remember this, and I want to end with this. God loves you. And uh, he loves you so much that he sent his son Jesus, and Jesus gave his all for you, his all. He didn't hold back at all. He did everything that is necessary for you to have forgiveness and salvation. But what Jesus does is he leaves the choice up to you. He's not going to make the choice for you. You have to choose. So I say, let's choose Jesus. Let's choose forgiveness. Let's choose life. Let's choose grace instead of the grave. Let's choose victory. Thank you, Jesus, for taking our place on the cross. Thank you, Jesus, for giving your all. Thank you, Jesus, for winning the victory over sin and death and offering that to us. And all the people said, Amen. God bless. Guys, love you so much.